Chapter Seven of Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford. This LibriVox recording's in the public domain. No, I ain't going out to Blenmont these days. Jarvis does his exercising here, and he says his mother's having a ballroom made out of that gym. I've been sticking to the pavements like I said I would, looking cheerful too. Why not? If you'd been a minute sooner, you'd heard me wobbling. Please, ma'am, nail a rose on me. But say. I'll give you the tale, and then maybe you can write your own ticket. You see, I'd left Swifty Joe running the physical culture studio, and I was doing a lap up the sunny side of the avenue just to give my holiday regalia an airing. I wasn't thinking a stroke, only just breathing deep and feeling glad I was right there and nowhere else. You know how the avenue's likely to go to your head these spring days? with the carriage folks swamping the traffic squad, and everybody that's anybody right on the spot or hurrying to get there, and every one of em as fit and finished as so many prize winners at a fair. Well, I wasn't looking for anything to come my way, when all of a sudden I sees a goggle-capped tiger throw open the door of one of them plate-glass benzene brooms at the curb, and bend over like he has a pain under his vest. I was just sidestepping to make room for some upholstered old battle-axe that I supposed owned the rig, when I feels a hand on my elbow and hears someone say, Why, Shorty McCabe, is that you? She was a dream, all right. One of your princess-cut girls, with the kind of clothes on that would make a turkey-red checkbook turn pale. But you couldn't fool me, even if she had put a Marcel crimp in that carroty hair of hers and washed off the freckles and biscuit flour. You can't change Irish blue eyes, can you? And when you've come to know a voice that's got a range from maple sugar to mixed pickles, you don't forget it either. Know her? Say, I was brought up next door to Sullivan's boarding house. You didn't take me for King Eddie, did you, Miss Sullivan? says I. I might buy the clothes, says she, running her eyes over me. Only I see you've got em beat by a mile. But why the Miss Sullivan? because I've mislaid your wedding card, and there's been other things on my mind than you since our last reunion, says I. But I'm charmed to meet you again, Ruly, and I begins to edge off. You act it, says she. You look tickled to death, almost, but I'm pleased enough for two. Anyway, I'm in need of a man about your weight to take a ride with me, so step lively, shorty, and don't stand there scaring the trade away from the silver shop. Come, jump in. Not me, says I. I never butts into places where there's apt to be a hubby to ask who's who and what's what. But there isn't any hubby now, says she. North Dakota them, says I. No, says she. I've got a decree good in any state. His friends called it a heart failure. I can't because I used to settle his bar bills. You're not shy of widows, are you? Now say, there's widows and widows. Grass baled hay, and other kinds, and most of them I passes up on general principles, along with chorus girls and lady demonstrators, but somehow I couldn't seem to place Sadie Sullivan in that line. Why, her mother and mine used to borrow cupfuls of flour of each other over the back fence, and it was to lick a feller who yelled bricktop after Sadie that started me to taking my first boxing lessons in Mike Quigley's barn. I ain't much used to traveling in one of these rubber-tired show windows, says I. But for the sake of old times, I'll chance it once. And with that I climbs in. The tiger puts on the time lock, and we joins the procession. Your car's all to the giddy, I remarks. Didn't it leave you some short of breath after blowing yourself to this, Sadie? I buy it by the month, says she, including James and Henri in front. It comes higher that way, but who cares? Oh, says I, he left a barrel then. A cellarful, says Sadie. And on the way up towards the park, I gets a scenario of the axe I'd missed. His name was Dipworthy. You've seen it on the labels. Dipworthy's drowsy drops. Youngsters yearn for him. Only he was Dipworthy Jr. and knew as little about the drop business as only sons usually do about such things. Drops wasn't his long suit, Quartz came nearer being his size. It was while he was having a sober spell that he married Sadie, but that was about the last one he ever had. She stuck to him, though, 
let him chase her with guns and hammer her with the furniture until the purple monkeys got him for good and all then she cashed in the drop business settled a life insurance president's salary on her mother bought a string of running ponies for the kid brother and then hit new york with the notion that here was where you could get anything you had the price to pay for but i made a wrong guess shorty says she it isn't all in having the money it's knowing how to make it get you the things you want there's plenty would like to give you lessons in that says i you says she say do i look like a con man says i there there shorty says she i knew better only i've been gold brick so much lately that i'd almost suspect my own grandmother i got two maids who steal my dresses and rings a lady companion who nags me about the way i talk and who hates me alive because i can afford to hire her and even the hotel manager makes me pay double rates because i look too young for a real widow do you know there are times when i almost miss the late dippy were you ever real lonesome shorty once or twice says i when i was far from broadway that's nothing says she to being lonesome on broadway and i've been so lonesome in a theater box with two thousand people in plain sight that i've dropped tears down on the trombone player in the orchestra and i was lonesome just now when i picked you up back there i had been into that big jewelry store buying things i didn't want just for the sake of having someone to talk to ah say says i cut it into smaller chunks sadie i'm no pelican you don't believe me says she i know this little old boy too well says i why with the hundred dollar bill you can buy more society than you could put in the hall but don't you see shorty says she that the kind you can buy isn't worth having you don't buy yours do you and i don't want to buy mine i want to swap even i'm not a freak nor a foreigner nor a quarantine suspect look at all these women going past what's the difference between us but they are not lonesome i'll bet they have friends and dear enemies by the hundreds while i haven't either there isn't a single home on this whole island where i can step up and ring the front doorbell i feel like a tramp hanging to the back of a parlor car what good does my money do me suppose i want to take a dinner at a swell restaurant i wouldn't know the things to order and i'd be afraid of the waiters think of that shorty i tried to but it was a strain if anyone else had put it up to me that sadie sullivan with a roll of real money as big as a bale of cotton could lose her noive just because she didn't have a visiting list i'd have told him to drop the pipe she was giving me straight goods though why her lip was trembling like a lost kid's chuck it says i for a girl that had a whole bunch of johnnies on the waiting list and her with only one best dress to her name at the time you give me an ache i don't set up for no great judge of form and figure but my eyesight's still good i guess and if i was choosing a likely looker i'd back you against the field that makes her grin a little and she pats my hand kind of sisterly like it isn't men i want you goose it's women my own kind says she and the next minute she gives me the nudge and whispers now watch the one in the chiffon panama shif which says i but she sees the one she means a heavyweight poison rigged out like a dry goods exhibit and topped off with millinery from the spring opening coming toward us behind a pair of nervous steppers she had her lamps turned our way and i hear sadie give her the time of day as sweet as you please she wasn't more than six feet off either but it missed fire she stared right through sadie as if there'd been windows in her and then toying to cuddle a brindle pup on the seat beside her acts like she owed you money says i we swapped tales of domestic woe for two weeks at colorado spring season before last said sadie but it seems that she's forgotten that's mrs morris pettigrew whose husband that one says i why she ain't such a much either i know folks that think she's a joke she feels that she can't afford to recognize me on fifth avenue just the same that's where i stand said sadie it's a crooked deal then says i and right there i began to get a glimmer of the kind of game she was up against talk about freeze-outs 
I'll show her, though, and the rest of them, says Sadie, sticking out her cute little chin. I'm not going to quit yet. Good for you, says I. It's a pastime I ain't up in at all. But if you can ever find use for me behind the scenes anywhere, just call on. I will, Shorty, says she. And right now, come on down to Sherry's with me for luncheon. Quit your kidding, says I. You don't want to queer the whole program at the start. I'd be lost in a place like that. Me in a sack suit and round top dicer. Why, the head waiter'd say scat, and I'd make a dive under the table. She said she didn't care a red apple for that. She wanted to sail in there and throw a bluff, only she couldn't go alone, and she guessed I'd do just as I was. Of course, I couldn't stand for no fool play of that kind. But seeing as she was so dead set on the place, I said we'd make it at eleven o'clock supper after the theater. But it must be my blow. I've got the clothes that'll fit into a night racket, says I. And besides, I've got to get a few points first. It's a go, says she. So we made a date, and Sadie drops me at the studio. I goes right into the phone and calls up Pinkney at the club. Didn't I tell you about him? Sure, that's the one. You wouldn't think, though, to see him and me tapping each other with the mitts that he was a front ranker in the smart push. But he's all that. He's a pacemaker for the swiftest bunch in the world. Say, if he should take to walking on his hands, there wouldn't be no men's shoes sold on Fifth Avenue for a year. Well, he shows up here about an hour later, looking as fresh as though he'd come off the farm. Did you say something about wanting advice, Shorty? says he. I did, says I. Religious or otherwise, says he, but it makes no difference. I'm yours to command. I don't ask you to go beyond your depth, says I. It's just a case of order and fancy grub. I'm due to blow a lady friend of mine to the swellest kind of supper that grows in the borough. No two-dollar table doty, understand? But special, real lace, eighteen-carat feed, with nothing on the bill of fare that ain't spelled in French. Ah, says he, something like the Barquettes, Bordelais, Poulette, and Casserole phrases o champagne and so on, eh? I was about to mention them very things, says I, but my memory's on the blink. Couldn't you write em down with a diagram of how they look and whether you spear em with a fork or take em in through a straw? Why, to be sure, says he. So he did, and it looks something like this. Consomme au fumé d'estagaron. Chicken soup, big spoon. Barguettes bordelaise. Marrow on toast with mushrooms, fork only. Fawns d'artichokes monogosque. Hearts of artichokes in cream sauce. Fork and breadsticks. There was a lot more to it, and it wound up with some kind of cheese with a name that sounded like breaking a pane of glass. I threw up my hands at that. It's no go, says I. I couldn't loin to say all that in a month. How would it do for me to slip the way to that program and tell him to follow copy? We'll do better than that, says Pinkney. Where's your phone? Pretty soon he gets someone on the wire that he calls Felix, and they has a heart-to-heart -heart talk in French for about ten minutes. It's all arranged, says he. You ought to hand my card to the man at the door as you go in, and Felix will do the rest. Eleven-fifteen is the hour. But I'm surprised at you, Shorty. A lady, eh? Ah, well, in the spring the young man's fancy gently turns. Ah, say, says I, there ain't no call for any funny cracks about this. You know me, and you can guess I'm no willy boy. When I get a soft spot in my head and try to win a queen, it'll be done on the dead quiet, and you won't hear no call for help. But this is a different proposition. This is a real lady who's been locked out of the society trust, and who takes an invite from me just because we happened to know each other when we was kids. Oh, ho, says Pinkney, snapping them black eyes the way he does when he gets real waked up. That sounds quite romantic. It ain't, says I. It's just as regular as taking your rant to a sacred concert. He seemed to want to know the details, though. So I told him all about Sadie and how she'd been ruled out of her class by a lot of stiffs who want one to sixteen with her, either for looks or lucre. And it's a crooked decision, says I. Maybe Sadie wasn't brought up by a Swedish maid and a French governess from Chelsea, Massachusetts, but she's on the velvet now, and she's a real hand-picked pippin, too. What more, 
She's a nice little lady with nothing behind her that you couldn't print in a Sunday school weekly. All she aims to do is to travel with the money burners and be sociable. And say, that's natural, ain't it? It's quite human, says Pinckney. And what you've told me about her is very interesting. I hope the little supper goes off all right. Ta-ta, shorty. Well, it begins frosty enough, for when it came to piloting a lady into that swell mob, I had the worst case of stage fright you ever saw. Say, them waiters is a haughty-looking lot, ain't they? But after we'd found Felix, I'd passed him the ten spot, and he bowed and scraped and towed us across the room like he thought we held a mortgage on the place. I didn't feel quite so much as if I'd got into the wrong flat. I did have something of a chill when I caught sight of a sheepish-looking cuss in the glass. He looked sort of familiar, and I was wondering what he'd done to be ashamed of, when I sees it was me. Then I squints around at the other guys and say, more than half of them wore the same kind of look. It was only the women that seemed right to home. There was only one in sight that didn't have her chin up and her shoulders back and carrying all the dog the law allows. They treated them stiff-necked food slingers like they was a lot of wooden Indians. You'd see em piling their wraps on one of them lordly gents as if he was a chair. Then they'd plant themselves, spread out their dry goods, peel off their elbow gloves, and proceed to rescue the cherry from the bottom of the glass. And Sadie? Well, say, you thought she'd never had a meal anywhere else in her life. The way she bossed Felix around and sized up the other folks calm as a Chinaman was a caution. And talk! I never had so much rapid-fire conversation passed out of me in a bunch before. Of course, she was just keeping her end up and making believe I was doing my share, too. But it was a mighty good imitation. Every now and then, she'd tear off a laugh so natural I could almost swear I said something funny, only I knew I hadn't opened my head. As for me, I was busy trying to guess what was under the silver covers that Felix kept bringing in and remembering what Pinckney had said about forks and spoons. Say, I suppose you've been up against one of those little after-the-players-over-suppers that they serve behind the lace curtains on Fifth Avenue, but this was my first offense. Little suppers? Honest now, that was more than I'd want if I hadn't been fed for a week. Generally, I can worry along with three squares a day, and when I do feel like having a bite before I hit the blankets, a Schweitzer Casa sandwich does me. But this affair had seven acts to it, and every one was a mystery. Why, I didn't know you were such an epicure, says Sadie. Me either, says I, but I'd never let myself loose before. Have some more pooly from the carousel, and help yourself to the... the other thing. Shorty, tell me how you managed it, says she. I've been taking lessons by mail, says I. You're a dear to do it anyway, says she. Just think of the figure I'd cut coming here by my lonesome. It's bad enough at the hotel with only Mrs. Prusett, and I've been wanting to come for weeks. What luck it was finding you today! Say, don't run away with the idea that I'm making a day's work of this, says I. I'm having a little fun out of this myself. There's worse company than you, you know. And I've met a heap of men stupider than Shorty McCabe, says she, giving me the jolly with that sassy grin of hers, and letting go of one of those goigly laughs that sounds as if it had been made on a clarinet. It was just about then that I looks up and finds Pinckney standing on one foot, waiting for a chance to butt in. Why, Professor, this is a pleasure, says he. Hello, says I. Where'd you blow in from? Then I makes him acquainted with Sadie and asks him what it'll be. Oh, he did it well, seemed as surprised as if he hadn't seen me for a year, and begins to get acquainted with Sadie right away. I tried to give her the wink, meaning to put her next to the fact that here was where she ought to come out strong on the broad A's and throw in the dauncher nose frequent. But it was a no-go. She didn't care a rap. She talked just as she would to me, asked Pinckney all sorts of fool questions, and inside of two minutes them two was carrying on like a couple of kids. I'm a rank outsider here, you know, says she, and if it hadn't been for Shorty, I'd never got in at all. Oh, sure, Shorty and I are old chums. We used to slide down the same cellar door. Selp me, I was plumb ashamed of Sadie then, giving herself away like that. 
but pinckney seemed to think it was great sport pretty soon he says he's got some friends over at another table and did she mind if he brought em over think you'd better says she i'm the mrs dipworthy of the drowsy drops you know and that's a tag that won't come off if you'll allow me says he i'll attend to the tag business they'll be delighted to meet you say says i soon as he left don't be a sieve sadie just forget old lang syne and remember that you're travelling high they've got to take me for what i am or not at all says she yes but you ain't got no cue to tell the story of your life says i that's my whole stock and trade shorty says she i was looking for her to revise that notion when i seized the kind of company pinckney was lugging up to spring on us i'd seen their pictures in the papers and knew em on sight and the pair wasn't anything but the top of the bunch you know the tombly cranes that cut more rice in july than the knickerbocker trust does all winter why say to see the house rubber at em as they came sailin our way you'd thought they was paid performers steppin up to do their act it was a case of bein in the limelight for us from that on holy chee says i here's where i ought to fade but there wasn't any show to duck for felix was chasin over some more chairs and pinckney was doin the honors all around and the first thing i knew we was a nice little family party chuckin repartee across the pink candle shades and behavin like star boarders that had paid in advance it was sadie though that had the center of the stage and i'll be staggered if she didn't jump in to make her bluff good she let out everything that she shouldn't have told from how she used to wait on table at her mother's boarding house to the way she got the frozen face ever since she came to town but what am i expected to do says she i got no heady green grip on my bank book there's the whole binful of the drowsy drop dollars and i'm willin to throw em on the bonfire just as liberal as the next one only i want a place around the ring there's no fun in playin a lone hand is there i've been tryin to find out what's wrong with me anyway my dear girl says mrs twombley crane there's nothing wrong with you at all you're simply delicious isn't she now freddie and freddie just grinned say some men is born wise professor mccabe and i are exchanging views on the coming lightweight contest says he don't mind us my dear perhaps that's what we were gassin about or why is a hen you can search me i was that rattled with sadie's noive display that i didn't follow anything else real close but when it was all over and i'd been brought to by a peep at the bill the waiter handed me i couldn't figure out whether she'd made a bull's eye or rung in a false alarm one thing i did notice as we sails out and that was the stout pettigrew poison who'd passed sadie the pickled pig's foot on the avenue that afternoon she was sittin opposite a skimpy little runt with a bald head at a table up near the door where the waiters juggled soup over her feathers every time they passed her eyes were glued on sadie as we came up and by the spread of the furrows around her mouth i see she was tryin to crack a smile now thinks i here's where she collects chill blains and feels the mercury drop but say would you look for it in a dream book what does sadie do but pass her out the glad hand and coo away like a powder pigeon on a cornice but being tickled to see her again oh they get me dizzy women do that one the marker though to the reverse english carom sadie takes after we got into a cab and started for her hotel was there a jolly for me or a thank you shorty i've had the time of my life nothing like it she just slumped into her corner and switched on the boo-hoos like a girl that's been kept after school enjoy yourself sadie says i only remember that this is a handsome not a street sprinkler that didn't affect us so after a while i tries her again what went wrong says i was she stringing you or was it the way i wore my face that queered the show it's all right shorty says she between weeps and nothing's wrong nothing at all mrs what's her names asked me to stay a week with her at newport place and old mrs pettigrew will turn green before morning thinking of me and i've shaken the hoodoo at last but it all came so much in a lump that i just had to turn on the sprayer you know how i feel don't you shorty sure says i 
just as well as if you'd sent me a picture postal of the place you boarded last. But say, I turned the trick, didn't I? I didn't know what was coming out of the box, of course, and maybe I was some jolted at throwing three sixes to a pair, but there they lay. No, I ain't going into the boosting line as a regular thing, but I guess if any amateur in the business gets a rose nailed on him, I ought to be the gent, not? End of chapter 7、Chapter Chapter Eight of Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Did you shut the hall door? That's right. There's no telling what's liable to float in here any time. Say, if they don't quit it, I'll get to be one of these nervous prostrators that thinks themselves sick of bed without half trying. Sure, I'm just convalescing from the last shock. How? Now make a guess. Well, it was this way. I was sitting right here in the front office, reading the sporting dope and taking me regular morning sun bath. When the door buzzer goes off and in drifts about a hundred and ninety pounds of surprise package, there was a foreign label on it, all right. But I didn't know until later that it read "Made in Austria." He was a beefy sort of gent with not much neck to speak of and enough curly black hair to shingle a French poodle. He was well coloured too. Beats the cars, don't it? The good health that's wasted on some of these foreigners. But what takes my eye the most was his trousseau. Say, he was dressed to the minute, from the pink in his buttonhole to the mother of pearl gloves. And the back of his frock coat had an incoive such as your forty fat sisters dream about. Why, as far as lines went, he had Jimmy Hackett and Robert Mantell on the back shelf. Oh, he was a crusher, sure. I have the purpose of finding Professor McCabe, says he, reading off in a card. If you mean McCabe, says I, I'm discovered. Is it you that are also by the name of Shorty? Says he, Shorty for short. Says I, and P C D on the end to lengthen it out. Physical Culture Director that stands for. Now, do you want my thumbprint and a snapshot of my family tree? That seemed to stun him a little, but he revived after a minute, threw out his chest, lifted his silk lid, and says, solemn as a new notary public taking the oath of office. I am Baron Patchouli. You look it, says I. Have a chair. I am, says he, getting a fresh start. Baron Patchouli of Hamstadt and Dusseldorf. All right, says I. Take the settee. How are all the folks at home? But say, there wasn't any use trying to jolly him into making a shortcut of it. He got his route of parade all planned out, and he meant to stick by it. Professor McCabe, says he. Don't says I. You make me feel like I'd been transplanted into French and was running a hack line. Call it McCabe, A B E, Abe. One thousand pardons says he and tries again. This time he gets it, almost, and I lets him spiel away. Oh, mamma! But I wish I could say it the way he did. It would let me on the proctor circuit if I could. But boiled down and skimmed. It was all about how I was a kind of safety deposit vault for everything he had to live for. My hopes, my fortune, my happiness, the very breath of my living—it is all with you," says he as a wind-up, hitting the Caruso pose, arms out, toes in, and his breath coming hard. How was that for news from home? I did some swift surmising, and then I says soothing like, "Yes, I know, but don't take on about it so." They're all right, just as you handed 'em over. Only I asked me friend the Sarge to lock 'em up till you called. We'll walk around and see the Sarge right away. Ah, says he, batting his noble brow. You do not comprehend. You make to laugh, and me, I come to you from the adorable Sadie. Sadie, says I. Sadie Sullivan, that was. He bows and grins. If you got credentials from Sadie, says I, it's all right. Now what's doing? Does she want me to match samples or show you the sights along the White Lane? Ah, the adorable Sadie says he, rolling his eyes and puffing out his cheeks like he was trying the lung tester. 
i drive with her i walk with her i sit by her side one day two day a week well what happens i am charm i am fascinate i am become her slave i make to resist i say to myself you you are the noble austrian blood the second cousin of your mother is a grand duke you must not forget then again i see sadie poof i have no longer pride but only i luff it is enough i ask of her madame deepworth where is the father of you she says he is not then the uncle of you i demand she says i am shy on uncles but to who then i ask must i declare my honourable passion oh she say tell it to shorty mccabe ha i leap i bound i go to m pinckney tell me i say where is to found one shorty mccabe and he sends me to you i am come on the level now it went like that maybe i've left out some of the frills but it was the groundwork of his remarks yes says i you're a regular come on i guess the adorable sadie has handed you a josh she's equal to it but that got by him he just stood there teetering up and down on his patent leathers and grinning like a monkey i say says i she's run you on a side and dropped you down a coal hole do you get wise did he not so you would notice it he goes on grinning and teetering like he was on exhibition in a museum and i was the audience then he gets a view of himself in the glass over the safe there and he begins to pat down his astrakhan thatch and punch up his puff tie and dust off his collar ever see one of those peroxide cloak models doing a march past the show windows on a day off well the baron had all those motions and a few of his own he was ornamental all right and it wasn't any news to him either about then though i begins to wonder if i hadn't been a little too sure about sadie there's no tellin when it comes to women you know and when it hit me that perhaps after all she'd made up a mind to tag this one from austria you could have fried an egg on me anywhere look here patchouli says i is this straight about you and sadie are you the winner ah the adorable sadie says he coming back to earth and slapping his solar plexus with one hand we've covered that ground says i what i want to know is does she cotton to you cotton cotton says he humping his eyebrows like a french ballad singer are you the fromage says i is she as stuck on you as you are on yourself have you made good he must have got a glimmer from that for he rolls his eyes some more breathes once like an air break being cut out and says our luff is like twin stars in the sky each for the other shines it's as bad as all that is it says i well all i've got to say is that i never thought it of sadie and if she sent you down here on approval you can tell her i'm satisfied as she is i figured that would jar him some but it didn't he looked as pleased as though i'd told him he was the ripest berry in the box and before i knew what was coming he had the long-lost brother tackle on me and was almost weeping on my neck spluttering joy in seven different kinds of language just then swifty joe bobs his head in through the gym door springs that gorilla grin of his and ducks back break away says i i don't want to spoil the looks of anything that sadie's picked out the frame but this thing has gone about far enough if you're glad and she's glad then i ain't got any kick comin only don't rub it in say it was like talkin to a deaf man sayin things to the baron she's mine yes says he i have your permission professor mccabe sure says i if she'll have you take her and welcome now you thought that would have satisfied him wouldn't you but he acted like he'd got a half-arm jolt on the wind he backed off cooled down as if i'd chucked a pail of water over him well says i you don't want it in writing do you i'm just out of permit blanks and me secretary's laid up with a bad case of mcgrawitis if i was you i'd skip back and keep my eye on sadie she might change her mind the baron thought he'd seen a red flag though he put in a worry period that lasted while you could count fifty 
then he forks out his trouble it is not possible that i have mistake is it says he i am learn madame deepworth is what you call one heiress no see i've been sort of looking for that and there it was as plain as a real estate map of gates of paradise long island me being so free and easy with telling him to help himself had thrown up a horrible suspicion to him was it true that sadie's roll was real money the kind you could spend at the store and say long's it was up to me to write a prospectus i thought i might as well make it a good one do you see that moving van out there says i the baron saw it and have you ever been introduced to these i says flashing a big wrist-sized wad of tens and fives oh he was acquainted all right well says i sadie's got enough of these put away to fill two carts like that fetch him why his fingers almost point a hole through his gloves ah says he and takes a little time to picture himself dipping into the family pocket-book course it wasn't any my funeral but when i thinks of a sure enough live one like sadie that i'd always supposed had a head like a billiard table getting daffy about such overstuffed frankfurter as this specimen i felt like someone had shoved a blue quarter on me worst of it was i'd held the stepladder for her to climb up where such things grow i was getting rawer to the touch every minute and was trying to make up my mind whether to give the baron a quick run down the stairs or go off and leave him try to dislocate his neck trying to see the small of his back in the mirror when in comes pickney with that little sparkle in his eyes that i've come to know means any kind of sport you're a mind to name hello says he giving the baron a hand you found him eh hello shorty got it all fixed have you say says i pulling pinckney over by the window did you put this up on me he says he didn't honest then take your fat friend by the hand says i and lead him off where things ain't liable to happen to him why what's up shorty says he haven't you given him your blessing and told him to go in and win switch off says i i've heard enough of that from the baron to last me a year what's it about anyway suppose he has laid his plans to miserize sadie What's he want to come hollering about it to me for? Well, I'm no matrimonial referee, am I? I knew something was tickling Pinckney inside, but he put up a front like a special sessions judge. Baron, says he, calling over to Patchouli, I forgot to mention that our friend, the professor, doesn't understand the European system of conducting such affairs as this. If you'll pardon me, I'll make it clear to him. Well, he did, and a lot more. It seems that the Baron was a ringer in the set where Sadie and Pinckney had been doing the weekend house party act. He'd been traveling on that handle of his, making some broad jumps and quick shifts, until he'd waked himself up from a visitor's card at a second-rate downtown club to the kind of folks that quit New York at Easter and don't come back until the snow flies again. They don't squint too close at a title in that crowd, you know first thing the baron hears of course is about the drowsy drop dollars and the goil that's got em he don't lose any time after that in making up to sadie he freezes to her like a park row wookstree boy does at a turkey drumstick at newsy's christmas dinner and for pickney and the rest of em it was as good as a play huh says i you're easy pleased ain't you but i want to tell you that it grouches me a lot to think that sadie'd fall for such a wad hutton party as that what ho says pickney here's a complication that we hadn't suspected meaning which says i perhaps it would be better to postpone that explanation says he but i sympathize with your state of mind shorty however what's done is done and meanwhile the baron is waiting wouldn't surprise me none says i to hear that that's his trade but say what kind of a steer is it that brings him to me i ain't got that straight yet Pinckney goes on to say as how the foreign style in negotiating for a goil is more or less a business proposition, and that Sadie, not having any old folks handy to make the deal, and maybe not having a game clear in her own mind, shoves him my way, just offhand. To be sure, says Pinckney, whatever arrangements you may happen to make will not be binding, but they will satisfy the baron. So just act as if you had full authority, and we'll see if there are any little details that he wants to mention. Sure enough, there was. 
he handed them to me easy oh nice and easy he didn't want much for a starter just a trifle put within easy reach before the knot was tied a mere matter of ten million francs no jims nor joes says i the baron is accustomed to reckoning in francs says pickney he means two million dollars two million cases says i catching my breath well say i had to take another look at em if i could think as well of myself as that i wouldn't ask no better patchouli says i you're too modest you shouldn't put yourself on the bargain counter like that the baron looks like i'd said something to him in chinese the professor thinks that the band is quite reasonable considering all things said pinckney and that went with the baron then he had to shake hands all around same as if we'd signed terms for a championship go and him and pinckney gets under way for some private highball factory over on the avenue i wasn't sorry to lose him somehow i wanted to get my mind on something else well i put in a busy morning trying to teach blocks and jabs to a couple of youngsters that think boxing is a kind of wrist exercise like piano playing and i got a pound or so off a nice plump old bishop who comes here for handball and stunts like that i was still feeling a bit ugly and wishing there was something sizable around to take it out on when in comes coily locks and pinckney again has he made up his mind that he wants my wad too says i to pinckney no says he the baron has discovered that up where sadie is staying the law requires a prospective bridegroom to equip himself with a marriage license he thinks he will get one in town and take it back with him now as you know all about such things shorty and as i have an appointment at twelve thirty i'll leave the baron with you so long and he gives me the wink as he slides out say i had my cue this trip all right I couldn't see just why it was, but the Baron had been passed up to me. He was mine for keeps. I could hang him out for a sign or wire a pan to him. And he was as innocent, the Baron was, as a new boy sent to a harness shop after strap oil. He got his eyes fixed on the drowsy drops bank account, and he couldn't see anything else. He must have sized me up as a sort of Santa Claus that didn't have anything to do between seasons but to be good to his kind. So you want to take out a license, do you? says I, coming to Mr. Smooth Play. If the professor would be so oblige, says he. Oh, sure, says I. That's my steady job. A marriage license, eh? I had a nineteenth-story view of the scheme he'd built up. He means to go back healed with the appointment from me, with the little matter of the two million ready all cinched, and the wedding papers in his inside pocket. Then he does the whirlwind rush at Sadie, and as he dopes it out to himself, figuring on what a crusher he is, he don't see how he can lose. And I suppose he thinks he can buy a marriage license most anywhere, same as you can a money order. With that, I had a stroke of thought. They don't hit me very often, but when they do, they come hard. I had to go over to the water cooler and grin into the tumbler. Then I walks up to the baron and taps him on the chest. Patchouli, says I, you come with me. I'll get you a Romeo outfit that'll astonish the natives. It took me about two hours chasing him down to the Bureau of Licenses and hunting up me old side partner, Jimmy Fitzpatrick. That's the main guy there. But I didn't grudge the time. Jimmy helped me out a lot. He's a keen one, Jimmy is, and when he got next, he threw in a lot of flourishes just where they was needed most. He never cracked a smile, either, when the baron tipped him a dime. I didn't let loose a patchouli till I'd seen him stow away that sealed envelope and had put him aboard the right train at the Grand Central. Then I went back to the studio, looking so contented that Swifty struck me for a raise. That was on a Monday. Long about Thursday, I thought I might get word from Pinckney or some of them, but there was nothing doing. Somebody's put coily locks wise, thinks I or else he's sneaked away to jump off the dock. I didn't have anyone on that afternoon, so I was just working off a little steam on the punching bag, doing the long roll and a few other stunts. I was getting nicely warmed up and hitting the balloon at a rate of about a hundred and fifty raps a minute, when I hears somebody breaks past Swifty and roars out, Where he is! Let me to him! It was the Baron, his mustache bristling out like a bottle cleaner, and blood in his eye. 
Har says he in real heavy villain style. You make me joke, you? Guan, says I over me shoulder. You was born a joke. Sit down and cool off, for it's your next. And with that, I goes at the bag again. Say, it ain't much of a trick to fight the bag, you know. Most any YMCA kid can get the knack of catching it on his elbows and collarbone, making it drum out a tune like the finish of a Dutch opera. And that's about all I was doing, only chucking a few extra pounds into it, maybe. But if you don't know how easy it is, it looks like a curtain raiser for manslaughter. And I reckon the Baron hadn't any idea I'd strip as bunchy as I do. Of course, there's no telling just what went on in his mind while he stood there. Swifty says his mouth come open gradual, like a bridge draw that's being swung for a tug, and his eyes began to bug out, and the noble Austrian assault and battery blood faded out of his face, same as the red does on the Belasco's sunsets. And pretty soon, when I thought my little grandstand play had a chance to sink in, I throws a good stiff one into the bag, ducks from under, and turns around to sing out, Next! to the Baron. But he wasn't in sight. Pinkney was there, though, and Sadie behind them, both looking wild. Hello, says I. Where's Patchouli? He was anxious to see me a minute ago. He seemed anxious not to when we passed him on the stairs just now, says Pinkney. Did he leave any word, says I. He just said, bah, and jumped into a cab, says Pinkney. He didn't hurt you, did he, says Sadie. What, him, says I. Not that I know about. But I've got this to tell you, Mrs. Dipworthy. If you put any high value on your new steady, you'd better chase him off this reservation. Why, Shorty McCabe, says she, taking me by the shoulders and turning them blue eyes of hers straight at me. My new steady? That, that woolly-haired freak. Say, you could have slipped me into the penny slot of a gum machine. Oh, fudge, piffle, splash. It's a wonder when I walk I don't make a noise like a sponge. I take some things in so easy. Is it curious my head never aches? Pickney sees how bad I was feeling, and he cuts in to tell me how things had worked out, and say, do you know what that patchouli had done? After I left him, he goes back tickled to death and waits for an opening. Then one night, when they was having a big hunt ball or some kind of swell jinx, he tolls Sadie into the palm room, drops the mat on his knees, and fires off that twin star luff speech, begging her to fly with him and be hisn. As a capper, he digs up the envelope to show her there needn't be any hitch in the program. What's this? says Sadie, making a sudden grab and getting the goods. With that, she lets go of a string of giggles and streaks it out into the ballroom. It is the document of our marriage, says the baron, making a bold bluff. Oh, is it? says she, opening the thing up and reading it off. Why, baron, this doesn't give you leave to marry anyone, says Sadie. This is a peddler's license, and here's the badge, too. If you wear this, you can stand on the corner and sell shoelaces and collar buttons. I'd advise you to go do it. It was while the crowd was howling and pinning the fakest tag on him that he began to froth at the mouth and tell how he was coming down to make mincemeat of me. That's why we followed him, says Pinkney, to avoid bloodshed. If he had so much as touched you, Shorty, says Sadie, I would have spent my pile to have him sent up for life. Oh, it wouldn't have cost that much, says I. With me thinking the way I did then, maybe there wouldn't have been a whole lot left to send. Ah, look away. I ain't tellin' what Sadie did next. But say, she's a humming boy, Sadie is. End of chapter 8「Nine of Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford. This LibriVox recordings in the public domain. How about him, eh? The two spot of clubs and billiard cloth and buttons at the door. There's no tellin' what the studio'll have next. Maybe a sidewalk canopy and a carriage collar. Swifty Joe's getting ambitious. Me getting mixed up with that Newport push has gone to Swifty's head like a four-line notice does to the pompadour of a second-row chorus girl. Foist off, he says it's a shame I don't have a valet. Say, says I, don't it keep me busy enough reminding you that I'm still able to wear my own clothes without putting on an extra hand. 
but after this last stunt he broke out again, so we compromised on Congo. I thought Swifty had him made to order, uniform and all, but he says he found him just as he stands, doing the stray act over on Sixth Avenue. He'd come up from New Orleans with a fortune-telling gent that had got himself pinched for doing a little voodoo toying on the side, and as Congo didn't have much left but his appetite, I put him on the payroll at two per and found. And say, I'm stung at that. To look at him, you'd think a ham sandwich would run him over, but he's got a capacity like a shoplifter's pocket. For three days I tried to feed him up on the retail plan, and then I let out the contract to a free lunch supply concern. Sure, it gives the joint a kind of swell look, having him at the door, and if it didn't act the same on Swifty's head, I wouldn't kick. On the dead now, I don't care so much about looming up in the picture. There's them that it suits down to the ground, and that shows up well in front. And then again, there's a lot of people gets a spotlight on em continual who'd be better off in the shade. I'm a top gallery boy by rights, and that's where you'll find me most of the time. But now and then I get dragged down into the wings with a note. Yes, yes, I'm just back after one of them excursions. You see, after we'd shunted Sadie's baron back to the goulash circuit where he belonged, and Sadie and Pickney had got over their merry fit and skipped off to wake up another crowd of time assassinators at Rocky Wold or some such place as that. I say to myself, Shorty, says I, you stick to the physical culture game and whittle out the byplays. That's just what I was doing, too, when an ADT shows up with a prepaid Josh from Pickney, giving me a special invite to run out and help him celebrate. Any come back, says the boy. No, Sonny, says I, you can cut the wire. Say, Pickney means all right, and he done me some good toins, but that don't put me in his class, does it? Nay, nay, says I. Here's one dinner party that I ducks, and with that I gets busy on one of my regulars who's been trained to go against two months of foreign cooking. I hadn't more than finished with him, though, when there comes another yellow envelope. This one was from Sadie, and it was a hurry call. She didn't say much, but I could see heel prints of trouble all over it. Me for Rocky Wold, says I, chucking the collar in the suitcase and grabbing a timetable off the rack. Yes, that was different. Maybe I'm a jay to cast myself for any such part, but since Sadie and me had that little reunion, I kind of felt that sooner or later she might be let in for a mix-up where I'd come in handy, and when it was pulled off, I wanted to be within hail course i wouldn't layin out no hero act like showin up with a can of gasoline just as the tank ran dry or battin the block off from a villain in a dress suit i was just willin to hang around on the edges and make myself useful generally not that i'm followin the shemale protectin business regular but with sadie it's another thing we used to play in the same alley you know and she don't forget it even if she has come into a bunch of green money as big as a haystack she was on hand when I dropped off the smoker, sitting in the rocky wold station riggin' looking for me with both eyes. And say, what a difference it makes to clothes who wears em. It's bully for you to come, Shorty, says she. Oh, I don't know, says I. I guess good judges wouldn't call it a metal play. What's loose? Buddy, says she. For a minute I was lost, until she asked if I don't remember the youngster. Oh, sure, says I. That kid brother of yours with the eighteen carat ringlets and a goily kind of face. The sisters used to dress him up in a Fauntleroy suit for the parochial school fair and make him look like a picture on an Easter card. Nice, cute little chap, eh? He was cute once, ten or twelve years ago, says Sadie. He isn't as cute as he was. He doesn't wear ringlets now. He likes rings better. And that's why I had to send for you, Shorty. I couldn't tell anyone else. Oh, the little wretch. If it wasn't for mother, I'd cure him of a lot of things. Well, we had some family history on the way out, beginning with the way Buddy had been spoiled at home, taking in a few of the scrapes Sadie had helped him out of, and ending with his blowing in at Rocky Wold without waiting for a bid from anyone. Seems he'd separated himself from the last stake Sadie had handed out, 
nothing new same old fool games and now he wanted a refill just as a loan until he could play a tip he got from a gent he met in a beanery and i just wouldn't stand for that says sadie those bookmakers are nothing but swindlers anyway i know because i bet ten dollars on a race once and didn't win say i had a lithograph of buddy and his beanery tip going up against an argument like that of course it wasn't more than two minutes before sadie got a sullivan up she offered buddy his choice between a railroad ticket home to mother or nothing at all but he wouldn't arbitrate on those lines he said he was a desperate man and that she'd be sorry before night sadie'd heard that before so she just laughed and said the steam car ticket offer would be held open until night she didn't see anything more buddy for a couple of hours and then she caught him as he came up from the billiard room being an expert on such symptoms she knew why he talked like his mouth was full of cotton but she couldn't account for the water bills he shook at her buddy could he'd run across a young englishman down there who thought he could handle a cue buddy had bet hot air against real money and trimmed his man that wasn't the worst of it though said sadie after i got him up to my rooms he pulled out the money again to count it over and out came a three-inch marquee ring an opal set with diamonds i knew the minute i put my eyes on it there were her initials on the inside too oh no one but mrs purdy pell tut tut says i you can easy square it with her but that's just what i can't do says sadie she loves me about as much as a tramp likes work she tells folks that i make fools of her boys her boys mind you she claims every stray man under twenty-five and when i came here she had three of them on the string goodness knows i didn't want em they're only imitations of men anyway and it was her ring that buddy had in his pocket maybe he hadn't lifted it says i sadie swallowed a bit hard at that but she wraps out the straight goods yes he did says she he must have sneaked it out of a room as he went downstairs think of it stealing he's done a lot of foolish things before but i didn't think he would turn out a crook the lord knows where he gets that kind of blood from not from the sullivans or the scannels either but i can't have him put away there's mother and he won't mind the thing i say now what shall i do shorty where's buddy now says i locked in my clothes closet with his hands tied and a gag in his mouth says she oh i can handle him that way big as he is and i wasn't going to take any more chances but it's likely that mrs pell has missed a ring by this time and is raising a howl about it what's to be done say there was a proposition for you and me just a plain everyday mitt juggler that don't like thinkin exercises regular guess you've pushed the wrong button this time sadie says i but i'll stay in your corner till the lights go out anyone else on not a soul says sadie that's some help says i foist we'll have a little talk with buddy i couldn't see what good that would do but it was up to me to make some kind of a move when they landed us under the porte cochere yes you'd call it stopping at the horse block i sails in like i'd come alone and hunts up pinckney what's all this about me being needed up here says i going to make me queen of the may by jove shorty says he that's a clever idea we'll do it yes you will not says i you cut it out i ain't no wine agent and i left me rag doll to home so if there's any funny stunts expected you tell em i've put on a sub oh sure i'll stay for dinner but as for leading any cotillions change the card he gave his word they wouldn't spring anything like that on me and then he called up a waiter in knee pants and had him show me up to my quarters so i could get me gas-like clothes on before they unlocked the dining-room doors after i made a quick shift i slid over into the next wing following directions and found sadie mrs pell's on the warpath already says she she's having it out with a maid now come in she's dug buddy out of the wardrobe and had him propped up in a corner better unstopper him and take off the bandages says i and say he had a lot of language corked up inside of him it wasn't very sisterly either and most of it would have sounded better at a race track 
but I shut the transom and motioned to Sadie to let him spiel away, never chipping in a word, only stand on one side and looking him over. So far as the outside went, he was a credit to the family, one of these slim, clean-cut youngsters with a lot of coily red hair, pink-white cheeks, and a pair of blue eyes that had nine kinds of deviltry in them. I could figure out how Mother might be able to see anything but good in Buddy, hanged if I could get very sore on him myself, and knowing how he'd been cutting up at that. Well, says I, when he got out of breath some, feel any better, do you? Huh? says he, giving me a squint sideways. Some cheap skate of a private detective, eh? You can't throw a scare into me that way, sis. Chase him out. Buddy, says I, give up the rings. How you know there was more than one, says he. Give up, says I, holding out me hand. He did it like a little man. There were two besides the Marquis, one an emerald as big as a lima bean, and the other a solitaire spark that could have been shoved up for three or four hundred. You see, a woman like Mrs. Poity Pell generally has a collection of those things lying around her dressing table, and knew if Buddy got any, he'd made a haul. I'm ashamed of you, Buddy, says I. You needn't be, said he. I guess you'd do the same if you had a sister who wanted to see you starve in the streets. Oh, you needn't screw up your eyebrows, Sadie. It's so. And if you don't cough up a thousand and let me go, I'll swipe anything in sight. I can stand being pinched if you can afford to have me. Sadie threw up her hands at that and began walking up and down the room. Do you hear that? says she. That's the kind of brother I've got. It's something awful, says I. Just hearing him talk makes me feel shivery. It beats the band how wicked some of these cigarette desperados do get. Don't, buddy, or I'll faint. I wouldn't dare stay in the room if your sister wasn't handy to tie you up again in case you started to cut loose. I got a good notion to push you in your face, says he. Don't pay any attention to him, shorty, says Sadie. I won't, says I, but I'm scared stiff. Just about then, though, but he seemed to have got a bulletin over a special wire. He was gazing at me with his mouth open and a pucker between his eyes. What, Shorty, says he. Say, you ain't Shorty McCabe, are you? Not to you, says I. I got to draw the line somewhere, and with bad men I stands on my dignity. I'm Professor McCabe, sonny. Holy cats, says he. Honest, Professor, I didn't mean a word of it. I take it all back. Why, say, I saw you put out the kangaroo in two rounds. Then you've had a liberal education, says I. Gee, says he, letting off some more surprise and bracing himself back in the chair like he was afraid of falling off. Well, say, I've been rode to my dressing room on shoulders and welcomed home from fights by mobs with brass bands. But for the genuine ovation, I guess Buddy's little stunt came as near as being a real thing as any. Dewey coming back from the Philippines, or Mrs. Get There Hadley landing on St. Louis with the standard oil scalps, wasn't in it with me being discovered by Buddy Sullivan. I couldn't get the key to it then, but I've mapped it out now. Most of his enthusiasm was owing to the fact that ever since he was fifteen, Buddy based his claim to being a real sport on my having come from the same block as he did. Anyway, it was a lightning change. From being a holy terror, Buddy calmed down to as peaceful a young gent as you'd want to meet. If I'd just shake hands with him once and call it square, he'd follow any program I'd mind to plan out. Only don't let her send me home to Ma, says he. Say, they get up at six in the morning there, and if I don't crawl down by seven, Ma lugs up toast and eggs and talks to me like I was a kid. Well, where'd you like to be shipped, says I. Oh, come now, Professor, says he. You don't have to be told that. There ain't but one place where a fella like me can really live. You get sis to put me back on Broadway with a few hundred in my clothes, and I'll kiss the book that she won't hear from me for a year. But how about this jewelry collecting fad of yours, says I. Ah, I wasn't going to carry it off, says he. I let her see I had it on purpose. I'll be good. Well, Sadie was willing to let it go at that, and we was just getting this part of the mix-up straightened out lovely, when there came a rap at the door. Quick, says Sadie, they mustn't see Buddy or you either, Shorty. So Buddy was pushed into the closet again, and I dodges behind a tall dressing mirror in the corner. 
It was a red-eyed girl with lumps in her throat. She said she was Mrs. Purdy Pell's maid. Mrs. Pell's missed some rings, says she, and we've been having words over it. I told her that there was a suspicious-looking young man in the house that I'd seen coming out of your rooms a while ago, and I didn't know but what you'd missed some things too, ma'am. Ask Mrs. Pell to stop over for a minute, says Sadie. What's doing, says I, after the maid had left? I don't know, says Sadie, but I've got to give that jewelry back to the silly thing foist. Then we'll see. So I handed the trinkets over, and it wasn't long before Mrs. Pell shows up. And say, the minute them two came together, the mercury dropped about thirty degrees. Being behind the glass, I couldn't see, but I could hear, and that was enough. Here are your lost things, says Sadie. That's her, every tick of the watch. If she was tackled by a gyasticulus, she'd grab it by the horns. Oh, says Mrs. Pell, gathering them in. And how does it happen that you have them? I'll tell you tomorrow, says Sadie. I'd rather not wait that long, says Mrs. Pell. I prefer to know now. You ought to be satisfied to get them back, says Sadie. Perhaps, says Mrs. Pell. But I'm just a little curious to know how they got away. My maid thinks the person who took them is still in the house. If I listen to all the things my maid says, begins Sadie. There are maids and maids, said Mrs. Pell. I can trust mine. She saw the man. More than that, Mrs. Dipworthy, she thinks he is hidden in your rooms. She must have seen my brother, says Sadie, or Professor McCabe. It's quite possible, said Mrs. Pell, but I shall insist on having the officers sent for. Why, says Sadie, I might have taken em myself, just as a joke. Indeed, said Mrs. Pell in a polite assault and battery tone. Then perhaps you will confess as much to the other guests, will you? And that was a facer for Sadie. She'd been keeping a stiff lip up to this, but she came to the scratch wobbly in her voice. You wouldn't want me to do that, would you? says she. In justice to my maid, I must, said Mrs. Pell. Well, says Sadie, if you're mean enough for that, I suppose I... But say, I couldn't stay under cover any longer, with her being pushed down to shoot in that style. I was wise to her game all right. She meant to stand up and take all that was coming, even if it put her down and out, just to keep the hooks off that kid brother of hers, and me loafing back in the ropes with me hands in me pockets. I'd be a welcher, wouldn't I? Did I hear my cue, says I, stepping out into the limelight? It was a tableau for fair. Me and Mrs. Purdy Pell didn't do anything but swap looks for a minute or so. I can't say just how pleased she was, but I've had better views. She wasn't any dainty lily of the valley sort. She was a good deal of a cabbage rose, I should say, and carried more or less weight for age. She had an arm on her like a forequarter of beef. I don't wonder that Purdy Pell skipped to Europe and didn't put in any answer when the proceedings came up. Are you the one, says she. No, he isn't, says Sadie, speaking up brisk. That's right, says I, but it was me brought your finger sparks back to light, ma'am. And where did you find them, says Mrs. Pell, turning the third degree stare on me. That's a professional secret, says I, which I can't give up just yet. Oh, you can't, says she. This is interesting. And with that, she begins to size us up one after the other. Oh, she had us tied to the post, with nothing to do but chuck the knives at us. For a gallery play, it was the punkiest I ever put up. Here I come splashing in with both feet, like an amateur lifesaver going to the rescue, and I hadn't done anything but raise the tide. Sadie didn't have a word to say. She was just biting her lip and getting white about the mouth from the mad in her. And say, maybe her stoutness didn't enjoy watching us squirm. She was getting even for every look one of her willy boys had ever wasted on Sadie. We'll see if you can be induced to confide your precious secret to the police, says she. I mean to find out who stole my rings. She had more than sent in that shot before the closet door opens and Buddy comes out, blinking like a bat. It's all over, ain't it, says he. It is now, says I, and looks to see Mrs. Purdy Pell begin to holler. Stop, thief! But it was a case of being off the alley again, 
Say, I'm glad I wasn't backin' my guesses with good money that night, or I'd come home with my pockets wrong side out. Ever see a hundred and eighty pound fairy with a double chin turned kittenish? That was her. Why, Mr. Sullivan, she goggles, throwing him a Julia Marlowe goo goo glance. Hello, Dimples, says Buddy. Oh, they were your rings, were they? Then it's all right. I just borrowed em to scare sister into a cat fit and make her open up, just for a josh, you know. Why, why, says Mrs. Pell, looking twisted. Is Mrs. Dipworthy your sister? Sure, says Buddy. But say, Dimples, you're the very girl I was wanting to see the most. I've got another sure thing, good as a title guarantee, for the croton stakes. And if you back it for me, we'll make a killin'. How about it, eh? Oh, you reckless boy, says Mrs. Pell, tapping him on the cheek. But you did give me such a lovely tip at the aqueduct, and... And we'll see. Come, I want to talk to you. And she put out a wing for him to take. As they drifted down toward the terrace, Buddy turns and gives us a sassy wink over his shoulder. Looks like we'd lost our job, Sadie, says I. The silly old moss agate, says Sadie. Then I goes down and reports to Pinckney and puts in the rest of the evening being introduced as a gent that set the bear and patchouli up in the shoestring business. I felt like I had opened up a jackpot on the four flush, but Pinckney and the rest seemed to be having a good time, so I stuck it out. In the morning, Buddy goes along back to town with me. Say, Professor, says he, patting a roll of twenties in his trousers pocket, I wouldn't pass this along to anyone else, but if you want to connect with a hat full of easy coin, just plunge on Candy Boy. That's your beanery tip, is it? says I. Much obliged, Buddy. But I guess after the bookies get all you and Mrs. Pell are gonna throw at em, they won't need mine. See, it was up to me to push home a great moral lesson, and I done my best. But what's the use? Next morning I takes up the paper and reads how Candy Boy wins, heads apart. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But say, I guess Buddy'll work out all right. There's good stuff in him. Anyways, I ain't losing my eyesight trying to follow his curves. And my daybook's been full lately. That's the way I like it. If you know how to take things, there's a whole lot of fun in just being alive, ain't there? Now look at the buffo combination I've been up against. First off, I meet Jarvis, you know, Mr. Jarvis of Blenmont, who's billed to marry that English girl, Lady Evelyn, next month. Well, Jarvis, he was all waked up. Oh, you couldn't guess it in a week. It was an awful thing that happened to him. Just as he got his trunk packed for England, where the knot tines to take place, he gets worried that some old lady that was second cousin to his mother, or something like that, has gone and died and left him all her property. Real thoughtless of her, wasn't it? says I. Well, says Jarvis, looking kind of foolish, I expect she meant well enough. I don't mind the bonds and that sort of thing, but there's this nightingale cottage. Now what am I to do with that? Raise nightingales for trade, says I. Jarvis ain't one of the joshing kind, though, same as Pinckney. He had this wedding business on his mind, and there wasn't much room for anything else. Seems the old lady who'd quit livin' was a relative he didn't know much about. I remember seeing her only once, says Jarvis, and then I was a little chap. Perhaps that's why I wasn't a favorite of hers. She always sent me a prayer book every Christmas. Must have thought you was hot on your prayer books, says I. She wasn't batty, was she? Jarvis wouldn't say that, but he didn't deny that there might have been a few cobwebs in the belfry. Aunt Amelia... That's what he called her. Had lived by herself so long and had coaxed up such a case of noise that there was no telling. The family didn't even know she was abroad until they heard she died there. You see, says Jarvis, the deuce of it is, the cottage is just as she stepped out of it, full of a lot of old truck that I've either got to sell or boin, I suppose, and it's a beastly nuisance. It's a shame, says I, but where is this nightingale cottage? Why, it's in Primrose Park, up in Westchester County, says he. With that, I pricks up my ears. 
You know I've been putting my extra long green in pickle for the last few years, laying for a chance to place them where I could turn them over some day and count both sides. And Westchester sounded right. Say, says I, leading them over to the telephone booth, you sit down there and ring up some real estate guy out in Primrose Park and get a bid for that place. It'll be about half a two thirds what it's worth. I'll give you that and ten percent more on account of the fixins. Is it a go? Was it? Mr. Jarvis had Central and was calling up Primrose Park before I gets through, and inside of an hour I'm a taxpayer. I've made big lumps of money quicker than that, but I never spent such a chunk of it so swift before. But Jarvis went off with his mind easy, and I was satisfied. In the evening I dropped around to see the Whaleys. Dennis, you low county bog trotter, says I. About all I've heard out of you since I was knee high was how you was aching to quit the elevator and get back to digging and cutting grass, same as you used to do in the old sod. Now here's a chance to make good. Well, say, that was the only time I ever talked ten minutes with Dennis Whaley about being blackguarded. He'd been fired off the elevator the week before and had been job hunting ever since. As for Mother Whaley, when she saw a chance to shake three rooms back into fire escape for a place where the trees had leaves on them, she up and cried into the corner beef and cabbage just for joy. I'll send the keys in the morning, says I. Then you two pack up and go there to Nightingale Cottage and open her up. If it's fit to live in and you don't die of loneliness, maybe I'll run up once in a while of a Sunday to look you over. You see, I thought it would be a bright scheme to hang on to the place for a year or so before I tries to unload. That gives the Whaleys what they've been wishing for, and me a chance to do the weekend act now and then. Of course, I wasn't looking for no complications, but they come along all right. It was on a Saturday afternoon that I took the plunge. You know how quick this little old town can warm up when she starts. We'd had the studio fans going all morning, and the first shirtwaist lads was parading across 42nd Street with their coats off, and Swifty'd made tracks for Coney Island, when I remembers Primrose Park. I'd passed through in expresses often enough, so I didn't have to look it up on the map, but that was about all. When I'd spoiled the best part of an hour on a local full of commuters and low-cut highbrows who killed time playing whist and cussing the road, I was dumped down at a cute little station about big enough for a lemonade stand. As the cars went off, I drew in a long breath. Say, I got off just in time to escape being carried into Connecticut. I jumps into a canopy-top surrey that looks like it had been stored in an open lot all winter, and asked the driver if he knows where Nightingale Cottage is. Sure thing, says he. That's the place Shorty McCabe's bought. Do tell, says I. Well, caught me out to the front gate and put me off. It was a nice ride. If it had been a mile longer, I'd had facts enough for a town history. Driving a depot carriage was just a side issue with that primrose blossom. Convoicing was his long suit. He tore off information by the yard and slung it over the seat back at me like one of these megaphone lecturers on the rubberneck wagons. According to him, Aunt Melly had been a good deal of a she hermit. Why, says he, Major Coitus Binger told me himself that in the five years he'd lived neighbors to her, he hadn't seen her more than once or twice. They say she hadn't been out of a yard for ten years up to the time she went abroad for her health and died of it. Anyone that could live in this town that long and not die couldn't have tried very hard, says I. Who's this Major Binger? Oh, he's a retired army officer, the Major is. Widower, with two daughters, says he. Singletons, says I. Yep, and likely to stay so, says he. About then, he toins in between a couple of fancy stone gate posts, twists around a cracked bluestone drive, and lands me at the front steps of Nightingale Cottage. For the kind, it wasn't so bad. One of those squatty bay-windowed affairs, with the roof like a toboggan chute a porch that did almost a whole lap around outside, and a cobblestone chimney that had vines growing up clear to the top. And sure enough, there was Dennis Whaley with his rake coming as near a grin as he knew how. 
Well, he has me in tow in about a minute, and I makes a personally conducted tour of me estate. Say, all I thought I was getting was a couple of building lots, but I'll be staggered if it wasn't a slice of ground most as big as Madison Square Park, with trees and shrubbery and posy beds and dinky little paths looping the loop all around. Out back was a stable and gooseberry bushes and a truck garden. How's them for cabbages, says Dennis. They look more like boutonnieres, says I. But he goes on to tell as how they'd just been set out and wouldn't be life-sized till fall. Then he shows the rows that he says was going to be praties and beans and so on, and he's as proud of the whole shooting match as if he'd done a miracle. When we got around to the front again, where Dennis laid out a pansy harp, I sees a little gathering over the front of the cottage next door. There were three or four gents and six or eight women folks. They was looking my way and talking all at once. Hello, says I. The neighbors seem to be holding a convention. Wonder if they're planning to count me in. I ain't more than got that out before one of the bunch cuts loose and heads for me. He was a nice-looking old duck with a pair of white chaunceys and a frosted chin splitter. He stepped out brisk and swung his cane like he was on parade. He was got up in white flannels in a square-topped Panama, and he had a complexion of a good liver. I expect that this is Mr. McCabe, says he. You're a good guesser, says I. Come up on the front stoop and sit by. My name, says he, is Binger. Coitus Binger. What, Major Binger, late USA, says I? The man that did the stunt at the Battle of what do you call it? Mission Ridge, sir, says he, throwing out his chest. Sure, that was the place, says I. Well, well, who'd think it? I'm proud to know you. Put her there. With that, I had him going. He was up in the air, and before he'd got over it, I'd landed him in a porch rocker and chased Dennis in to dig a box of fumadors out of my suitcase. Ahem, says the Major, clearing his speech tubes. I came over, Mr. McCabe, on rather a delicate errand. If you're out of butter or want to touch me for a draw and a tea, speak right up, Major, says I. The pantry's yours. Thank you, says he. But it's nothing like that. Nothing at all, sir. I came over as a representative of several citizens of Primrose Park to inquire if it is your intention to reside here. Oh, says I, you want to know if I'll join the gang? Well, seeing as you put it up to me so urgent, I don't care if I do. Of course, I can't sign as a regular, this being my first jab at the simple life, but if you can stand for a punk performance, I'll make it progressive euchre and croquet, and you can put me on the Saturday night sub list for a while anyway. Now, say, I was laying out to do the neighborly for the best that was in me, but it seemed to hit the major wrong. He turned about two shades pinker, coughed once or twice, and then got a fresh hold. I'm afraid you failed to grasp the situation, Mr. McCabe, says he. You see, we lead a very quiet life here in Primrose Park, a very domestic life. As for myself, I have two daughters. Cheek, cheek, Major, says I, poking him gentle in the ribs with me thumb. Don't you try to sick any goyles on me, or I'll take to the tall timber. I'm no ladies man, not a little bit. Then the explosion came. For a minute I thought one of them Frisco ague spells had come east. The major turns plum color, blows up his cheeks and bugs his eyes out. When the language flows, it was like toining on a fire pressure hydrant. An assistant district attorney summoned up for the state in the murder trial didn't have a look in with the major. What did I mean? Me, a roughhouse scrapper from the red light section, by buttoning in to a peaceful community and insulting the oldest inhabitants. Didn't I have no sense of decency that I suppose respectable people were going to stand for such? Honest, that was the waste jolt I ever had. All I could do was to sit there with my mouth ajar and watch him prancing up and down, handing me the layout. Say, says I, after a bit, you ain't got me mixed up with Mark Duck or Patty the Gouge or Kangaroo Mike or any of that crowd, have you? You're known as Shorty McCabe, aren't you, says he. Guilty, says I. Then there's no mistake, says he. What will you take cash down for this property and clear out now? Say, Major, says I, 
do you think it would blight the buds or poison the air much if I hung on till Monday morning? That is, unless you've got the tar all hot and the rail ready. That fetched a grunt out of him. All we desire to do, sir, says he, is to maintain the respectability of the neighborhood. Do the other folks over there feel the same way about me, says I? Naturally, says he. Well, says I, I don't mind telling you, Major, that you've thrown the hooks into me good and plenty, and it looks like I'd have to make a new book. I didn't come out here to break up any peaceful community, but before I change my program, I'll have to sleep on it. Suppose you slide over again some time tomorrow and your collar don't fit so tight, and then we'll see if there's anything to arbitrate. Very well, says he, does a salute to the colors and marches back stiff-kneed to tell his crowd how he'd read the riot act to me. Now say, I ain't one of the kind to lose sleep because the conductor speaks rough when I ask for a transfer. I generally take what's coming and grins. But this time I wouldn't have so joyful as I might have been. Even the sight of Mother Whaley's hot biscuits and hearing her singing Kushla Mavornin in the kitchen couldn't choke me up. I'd been keen for looking the house over and seeing what I'd got in the grab. But it was all off. Of course I knew I had the rights of the thing. I put down me good money, and there wasn't any rules that could make me pull it out. But I'd lived quite some years without shoving in where I knew I'd get the frigid countenance, and I didn't like the idea of beginning now. I couldn't go back on my record either. In my time, I've stood up in the ring and put out my man for two-thirds of the gate receipts. I ain't so proud of that now as I was once, but I ain't never had any call to be ashamed of the way I'd done it. What's more, no soubrette ever had a chance to call herself Mrs. Shorty McCabe, and I never let em put my name over the door for any Broadway jag parlor. You got to let every man frame up his own argument, though. If these Primrose Parkers had listed me for a tough citizen— that had come out to smash Crocky and keep the town constable busy. It wasn't my cue to hold any debate. All the campaign I could figure out was to back into the wings and sell to some well-behaved stockbroker or life insurance grafter. It was going to be tough on the Whaleys, though. I didn't let on to Dennis, and after supper we sat on the back steps while he smoked his cutty and gassed away about the things he was going to raise and how the flower beds would look in a month or so. About nine o'clock he showed me a place where I can turn in, and I listens to the roosters crowing most of the night. Next morning I had Dennis get me a Sunday paper, and after I'd read the sporting notes, I turns to the suburban real estate ads. Why not own a home, most of em asks. Well, I know the answer to that, says I. And say, a Luna Park Zulu that had strayed into young Rockefeller's Bible class would have felt about as much at home as I did there on my own porch. The old major was over on his porch, walking up and down like he was doing guard duty, and once in a while I could see some of the women folks taking a careful squint at me behind a window blind. If I'm ever quarantined, it won't be any new sensation. It wasn't exactly a wedding breakfast kind of a time I was having, but I didn't dodge it. I was just letting it soak in, for the good of me soul, as Father Connolly used to say, when I sees a pair of overfed blacks hitched to a closed carriage switch in from the pike and make for the majors. Company for dinner, says I. That's nice. I didn't get anything but a back view as he climbed down on the off side and was let in by the major. But you couldn't fool me on them short-legged, baggy-kneed pants or the black griddle cake bonnet. It was my little old bishop that I keeps the fat off from with the medicine ball wake. Lucky he didn't see me, says I, or he'd haul it out and queered himself with the whole of Primrose Park. I was figuring on fading away to the other side of the house before he showed up again. But I didn't hurry about it, and when I looks up again, there was the bishop with them fat little fingers of his stuck out and a three-inch grin on his face, piking across the road right for me. He'd come out to wigwag his driver, and getting his eyes on me, he waddles right over. I tried to give him the wink and shoo him off, but it was a no-go. Why, my dear professor, says he, walking up and giving me the inside brother grip with one hand and the old college trum shoulder pat with the other. 
I squints across the way, and there was the Major and the girls, catching their breath and taking it all in, so I sees it's no use throwing a bluff. How's the bishop, says I? You've made a bad break, but I guess it's a bit too late to hedge. He only chuckles, like he always does. Your figures of speech, Professor, are too subtle for me as usual. However, I suppose you are as glad to see me as I am to find you. Just what I was meaning to spring next, says I, pulling up a rocker for him. We chins a while there, and the bishop tells me how he's been out to lay some cornerstone and thought he'd drop in on his old friend Major Binger. Well, well, what a charming place you have here, says he. You must take me all over it, Professor. I want to see if you've shown as good taste on the inside as you apparently have on the out. And before I has time to say a word about Jarvis's Aunt Melly, he has me by the arm and we're headed for the parlor. I hadn't even opened the door before, but we blazes right in, run up the shades and throws open the shutters and stands by for a look. Say, it was worth it. That was the most ladyfied room I'd ever put me foot in. First place, I never see so many crazy-looking little chairs or bow-legged tables or fancy teacups before in my life. That wasn't a thing you could sit on without having to call the upholstery man in afterward. Even the gilt sofa looked like it ought to have been in a picture. But what had me button-eyed was the wall decorations. If I hadn't been riding on the sprinkler for so long, I thought it was time for me to hunt the D.T. Institute right then. First off, I couldn't make them out at all. But after the shock wore away, I see there were dolls, dozens of them, hanging all over the walls in rows and clusters like ham in a pork shop. And say, that was the wooziest collection ever bunched together. They weren't ordinary Christmas tree dolls, the store kind. Every last one of them was homemade, white cotton heads with hand-painted faces. Course I tumbled. This was some of that half-batty Aunt Melly's work. This is what she put her time in, and she sure had produced. For face painting, it was well done, I guess. Only she must have been shut up so long away from folks that she forgot just how they looked. Some of the heads had sunbonnets on, and some nightcaps. But they were all the same shape, like a hard-shell clam, flat side too. The eyes were painted about twice life-size, some rolled up, some canted down, some squinting sideways, and a lot was just cross-eye. There was green eyes, yellow eyes, pink eyes, and the regular kinds. They gave me the creeps. When I turns around, the bishop stands there with his mouth open. Why, says he, why, professor, that was as far as he could get. He gasps once or twice and gets out something that sounds like, Remarkable, truly remarkable. That's the word, says I. I'll bet there ain't another like this in the country. I, I hope not, says he. No offense meant, though. Do you, er, uh, do this sort of thing yourself? Well, I had to loosen up then. I told him about Aunt Melly and how I'd bought the place unsight and unseen. And when he finds this was my first view of the parlor, it gets him in the short ribs. He has a funny fit. Every time he takes a look at them dolls, he has another spasm. I gets him out on the porch again, and he sits there slapping his knees and wagging his head and wiping his eyes. By and by, the bishop calms down and says I've done him more good than a trip to Europe. You let me bring Major Binger over, says he. I want him to see these dolls. You two are bound to be great cronies. I've got my doubts about that, says I. But don't you go mixin' up in this affair, Bishop. I don't want to lug you in for any trouble with any of your old friends. You couldn't stave the Bishop off, though. He had to hear the whole yarn, and the minute he gets it straight, he jumps up. Being as a hot-headed old, well, says he, catching himself just in time. The Major has a way of acting foist and then thinking it over. I must have a talk with him. I guess he did, too for they were at it some time before the bishop waves bye-bye to me and drives off. I'd just got up from one of Mrs. Whaley's best chicken dinners when I hears a hurrah outside and horses stamping and horn tootin'. I rushes out front, and there was Pinckney sitting up on the coach box, just pulling his leaders out of Dennis's pansy bed. 
there was about a dozen of his crowd on top of the coach including mrs dipworthy sadie sullivan that was and mrs twombley crane and a lot more hello shorty says pinckney is the doll exhibition still open if it is we want to come in they'd met the bishop see and he'd steered em along well say i might have begun the day kind of lonesome but it had a lively finish all right inside of ten minutes sadie has on one of mother whaley's white aprons and is taken charge she has some of them fancy tables and chairs lugged out to the porch and the first thing i knows i'm holdin forth at a pink tea that's the swellest thing of the kind primrose park ever got its eyes on end of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of Shorty McCabe by Sewell Ford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. No, Nightingale Cottage ain't in the market, and it looks like I'd got a steady job introducing Aunt Melly's doll collection to society. For Pickney carts down a new gang every Sunday. As Sadie's generally on hand to help out, I'm ready to stand for it. Anyways, I bought a family ticket and laid in a stock of fancy groceries. The mage. Oh, him and me made it up handsome. He comes over and tells me about that Mission Ridge stunt of his every chance he gets. But say, I'm beginning to find out there's others. It's a great place, Primrose Park is, and when I sized it up as a sort of annex to a cemetery, I'd mistook the signs. It don't make much difference where you are. All you got to do to keep your blood from thinning out is to mix in with folks. Beats all how much excitement you can dig up that way. Now, I wasn't hunting for anything of the kind, but I was just using my eyes and keeping my ears open, so I notices that out on the main road in front of the park is one of those swell big ranches that hog the shore front all the way from Mott Haven up to the jumpin' off place. From the outside, all you can see is iron gates and stone wall and stretches a green plush lawn. Way over behind the trees, you can get a squint at the chimney tops and you know that underneath is a little cottage about the size of the Grand Central Station. That's the style you live in when you've hit the stock market right, or in case you've got to be a top-notch grafter that the muckrakers ain't jungled yet. I've been wondering what kind of folks hung out in there, but I'd never seen any of em out front, only gardeners killin' time and coachmen exercising the horses. But one morning I gets a private view that was worth watchin' for. The first thing on the program was an old duffer dodging in and out round the bushes and trees like he was trying to lose somebody. That got me curious right away, and I begins to pipe him off. He was togged out in white ducks, something like a window cook in a three-off joint, only he didn't sport any apron, and his cap had gold braid on it. His hair was white, too, and his underlip was decorated with one of them old-fashioned teasers just a little bunch of cotton that the barber had shied. He was a well-built old boy, but his face had sort of a sole-leather tint to it that didn't look healthy. From his motions, I couldn't make out whether he was having a game of hide-and-go-seek or being chased by a dog. The last thought seemed more likely, so I strolls over to the stone wall and gets ready to hand out a swift kick to the keoodle in case it was needed. When he sees me, the old gent begins to dodge livelier than ever and makes signals with his hands. Well, I didn't know his code. I couldn't guess whether he wanted me to run for a club or was trying to keep me from butting in. So I just stands there with my mouth open and looks foolish. Next thing I sees is a wedge-faced long-legged guy coming across the lawn on the jump. First off, I thought he was pushing one of these sick of bed chairs, like they use on the boardwalk at Atlantic City. But as he gets nearer, I see it was a green wicker tea wagon, you know. I ain't got to the tea wagon stage myself, but I've seen him out at Rocky Wold and them places. Handy as a pocket and a shirt they are. When you've got company in the afternoon, the butler wheels the thing out on the veranda and digs up a whole tea-making outfit from the inside. When it's shut in, looks like a good deal of one of them laundry push carts they have in Harlem. Now, I ain't in love with tea at any time of the day except for supper, and I sure would pass it up just after breakfast, 
but I don't know as I'd break my neck to get away from it, same as the old gent was doing. The minute he gets a look at the wagon coming his way, he does some lively side-stepping. Then he jumps behind a bush and hides, giving me the sign not to let on. The long-legged guy knew his business, though. He came straight on like he was following a scent, and the first thing old Whitey knows is he's been run down. He gives in then, just as if he'd been tagged. Babbitt, says he, I had you hold down at one time, didn't I? But either Babbitt was too much out of breath, or else he wasn't the talkative kind, for he never says a word, but just opens up the top of the cot and proceeds to haul out some bottles and a glass. First, he spoons out some white powder into a tumbler. Then he pours in some water and stirs it with a spoon. When the mess is done, he sticks it out to the old gent. The old one never lifts a finger, though. Salute first, you frozen-faced scum of the earth, he yells. Salute, sir. Babbitt made a stab at salutin', too, and mighty sudden. Now, you white-livered imitation of a man, says the old gent, you may hand over that villainous stuff. Bah! And he takes a sniff to it. Babbitt keeps his eyes glued on him until the last drop was down. Then he jumped. Lucky he was quick on the duck, for the glass just whizzed over the top of his head. While he was stowing the things away, the old fella let loose. Say, you talk about cussin'. I'll bet you never hoid a string like that. It wasn't the longshoreman's kind, but the way he put together straight dictionary words was enough to give you a chill. It was a rattling style he had of ripping them out, too, that made it sound like swearing. If there was any part of that long-legged guy that he didn't pay his respects to, from his ears to his toenails, I didn't notice it. "'It's the last time you get any of that slush into me, Babbitt,' says he. "'Do you hear that, you peanut-headed, scissor-shanked whelp?' Ten thirty's the next dose, Commodore,' says he as he starts off. "'It is, eh, you wall-eyed deck swab?' howls the Commodore. If you mix any more of that infant food for me, I'll skin you alive, and sew you up hindside before. Do you hear that, you? I was wearing a broad grin when the old Commodore turns around to me. If that fella keeps this up, says he, I shall lose my temper some day. Ever drink medicated milk, eh? Ugh! Taste the way burnt feathers smell. And I'm dosed with it eight times a day. Think of it. Milk! But what makes me mad is to have it ladled out to me by that long-faced fish-eyed food destroyer, whose only joy in life is to hunt me down and gloat over my misery. Oh, I'll get square with him yet, sir. I swear I will. I wish you luck, says I. Who are you, anyway, says he. Nobody much, says I. So there's two of us. I'm living in the cottage across the way. The deuce, you say, says he. Then you're Shorty McCabe, aren't you? You're on, says I. How'd you guess it? Well, it seems one of my regulars was a partner of his son-in-law, who owned the big place, and they'd been talking about me just the day before. After that, it didn't take long for the Commodore and me to get a line on each other, and when I finds out he's Roaring Dick, the noivy old chap that stood out on the front porch of his ship all through the muss at Santiago Bay and hammered the daylights out of the Spanish fleet, I gives him the hand. I read about you in the papers, says I. Not so often as I used to read about you, says he. And say, inside of ten minutes, we was like a couple of G.A.R. vets at a reunion. Then he told me all about the medicated milk business. It didn't take any second sight to see that the Commodore was a gay old sport. He'd been on the European station for three years, knocking around with kings and princes and French and Russian naval officers that was grand dukes and such when they was ashore. And he carried along with him a truck driver's thirst and the capacity of a ward boss. The fizzy stuff he'd stowed away in that time must have been enough to sail a ship on. I guess he didn't mind it much, though, for he'd been in a pickle a long time. It was a seventeen-course night dinners and the foreign cooking that gave him the knockout. All of a sudden, his digester had thrown up the job, and before he knew it, he was in a state where a hot biscuit or a piece of fried potato would lay him out on his back for a week. 
he come home on sick leave to visit his daughter, and his rich son-in-law had steered him up against the specialist who told him that if he didn't quit and obey orders, he wouldn't last three weeks. The orders was to live on nothing but medicated milk, and for a man that had been living the way he had, it was an awful jolt. He couldn't be trusted to take the stuff himself, so they hired valets to keep him doped with it. I scared the first one half to death, says the Commodore, and the next one I bribed to smuggle out ham sandwiches. Then they got this fella Babbitt to follow me around with that coist go-cart, and I haven't had a moment's peace since. He's just about equal to the job like that, Babbitt is. I make him earn his money, though. You'd have thought so if you could have seen the old Commodore wake up games to throw Babbitt off the track. I put in most of the day watching him at it, and it was as good as a vaudeville act. About a quarter of an hour before it was time for the dose that the valet would come out and begin to look around the grounds, soon as he located the Commodore, he'd slide off after his tea wagon. That was just where the old boy got in his fine wake. The minute Babbitt was out of sight, the Commodore makes a break for a new hiding place, so the valet has to wheel the cart all over the lot, playing peekaboo behind every bush and tree until he nailed his man. Now you'd think most anyone with a head would have cracked a joke now and then with the old gent, and kind of made it easy all around. But not Babbitt. He'd been hired to get medicated milk into the Commodore, and that was all the idea his nut could accommodate at one time. He was one of these stiff-necked, cold-blooded flunkies that don't seem much more human than wooden Indians. He had an aggravating way, too, of treating the old chap when he got him cornered. He was polite enough, so far as what he had to say, but it was the mean look in his ratty little eyes that grated. With every dose, the Commodore got madder and madder. Some of the names he thought up to call that valet was worth putting in a book. It seemed like a shame, though, to stir up the old gent that way, and I don't believe the medicine did him any more good. He took it, though, because he promised his daughter he would. Of course, I had my own notions of that kind of treatment, but I couldn't see that it was up to me to jump in the coach's box and give off any advice. Next morning, I'd been out for a little leg wake, and I was just jogging into the park again when I hears all kinds of a ruction going on over behind the stone wall. There was screams and yells and shouts, like a Saturday night riot in the double alley. I pokes up a giraffe neck and sees a couple of women running across the lawn. Pretty soon what they was chasing comes into view. It was a Commodore. He was pushing a tea wagon in front of him, and in the top of that, with just his legs and arms sticking out, was Babbitt. I knew what was up in a minute. He'd lost his temper just as he was afraid he would, and before he'd got it back again, he'd grabbed the valet and jammed him head foist into the green cart. But where he was going with him was more than I could guess. Anyway, it was somewhere that he was in a hurry to get to, for the old boy was rushing the outfit across the front yard for all he was worth. Oh, stop him, stop him, screams one of the women that I figures out must be the daughter. Stop him, stop him, yells the other. She looked like one of the maids. I'm no backstop, thinks I to myself. Besides, this is a family affair. I'd have hated to have blocked that run, too, for it was doing me a lot of good just watching it and thinking of the bumps Babbitt was getting with his head down among the bottles. I follows along the outside, though, and in a minute or so, I sees what the Commodore was aiming at. Out the one side was a cute little fish pond, about a hundred feet across, and he was making a bee line for that. It was down in a sort of hollow with a nice smooth turf sloping clear to the edge. When the Commodore gets halfway down, he gives the cart one last push, and five seconds later, Mr. Babbitt, with his head still stuck in the wagon, souses into the water like he'd been dropped from a balloon. The old boy stays just long enough to see the splash, and then he keeps right on going towards New York. At that, I jumps the stone wall and prepares to do some quick diving, but before I could fetch the pond, Babbitt comes to the top, blowing muddy water out of his mouth and threshing his arms around windmill fashion. Then his feet touch his bottom, and he finds he ain't in any danger of being drowned. The wagon comes up, too, and the first thing he does is to grab that. By the time I gets there, he was wading across with the cart, 
and the women had made up their minds there wasn't any use fainting. Babbitt, says the Commodore's daughter, explain your conduct instantly. What were you doing standing on your head in the tea wagon? Please, ma'am, I... I forget, sputters Babbitt, wiping the mud out of his eyes. You forget, says the lady, and say, anyone that knew the old Commodore wouldn't have to do any guessing as to who her father was. You forget, do you? Well, I want you to remember. Out with it now. Yes, ma'am, says Babbitt, trying to prop up his wilted collar. I just give him his first dose for the day, and I dodge the glass when something catches me from behind, throws me into the tea wagon, and off I goes. But that dose counts, don't it, ma'am? He got it down. I see how it was then. Babbitt had been getting a commission for every glass of the medicated stuff he pumped into the Commodore. Will you please run after my father and tell him to come back, says the lady to me. Sorry, says I, but I'm no antelope. You better telegraph him. I didn't stay to see any more. I was that sore on the whole crowd. But I hoped the old one would have sense enough to clear out for good. I didn't hear any more from my neighbors all day, but after supper that night, just about dusk, somebody sneaks in through the back way and wobbles up the veranda where I was sitting. It was the old Commodore. He was about all in, too. Did, did I drown him, says he. You made an elegant try, says I. There wasn't water enough. Thank goodness, says he. Now I can die calmly. What's the use dying, says I. Ain't there nothing else to do but that? I've got to, says he. I can't live on that coised stuff they've been giving me. And if I eat anything else, I'm done for. The specialist said so. Oh, well, says I. Maybe he's made a wrong guess. It's your toy now. Suppose you come in and let me have Mother Whaley broil you a nice juicy hunk of steak. Say, he was near starved. I could tell that by the way he looked when I mentioned broiled steak. He shook his head, though. If I did, I'd die before morning, says he. I'll bet you a dollar you won't, says I. That almost gets a grin out of him. Shorty, says he, I'm going to risk it. It's better than starving to death, says I. And he sure did eat like a hungry man. When he put away a good square meal, including a dish of sliced raw onions and two cups of hot tea, I plants him in an armchair and shoves out the cigar box. He looks at the fumador as regretful. They've kept those locked away from me for two weeks, says he, and that was worse than going without food. Smoke up, then, says I. There's one do ye. As it will probably be my last... I guess I will, says he. Honest, the old gent was so sure he'd croak before morning that he wanted to write some farewell letters, but he was too done up for that. I tucked him into a spare bed, opened all the windows, and before I could toyne out the light, he was sawing wood like a hired man. He was still working the foghorn when I went in to rout him out at five o'clock. It was a tough job getting him up, but I got him out of his trance at last. Come on, says I. We've got to do our three miles and have a rub down before breakfast. Foist off, he swore he couldn't move, and I guess he was some stiff from his sprint the day before. But by the time he got out where the birds were singing and the trees and grass looked like they'd been done over new during the night, I was able to coax him into a dog trot. It was a gentle little stunt we did, but it limbered the old boy up, and after we'd had a cold shower and a quick rub, he forgot all about his joints. Well, are you set on keeping that date in the obituary column, or will we have breakfast, says I? Well, I could eat a cold lobscouse, said he. Mother Whaley's got something better than that in the kitchen, says I. I suppose this will finish me, says he, tackling the eggs and corn muffins. Now wouldn't that give you the pip? Why, with their specialists and medicated dope, they got the old chap so leery of good straight grub that he was being starved to death. And even after I got him braced up into something like condition, he didn't think it was hardly right to go on eating. I expect I ought to go back and start on that slop diet again, says he. I couldn't stand by and see him do that, though. He was too fine an old sport to be polished off in any such style. See here, Commodore, says I. If you're dead stuck on making a living skeleton of yourself, why, 
I throws up me hands. But if you'll stay here for a couple of weeks and do just as I say, I'll put you in the trim to hit up the kind of life I reckon you think is worth living. By glory, says he, if you can do that, I'll... No, you won't, says I. This is my blow. Of course it was a cinch. He wasn't any invalid. There was stuff enough in him to last for twenty years if it was handled right. He begun to pick up right away. I only worked him hard enough to make the meals seem a long ways apart and the mattress feel good. Inside of a week, I had the red back in his cheeks and he was chucking the medicine ball around good and hard and telling me what a scrapper he used to be when he first went to the cadet mill down to Annapolis. You can always tell when these old boys feel kinky. They begin to remember things like that. Before the fortnight was up, he wasn't shying at anything on the bill of fare, and he was hitting around that his thirst was coming back strong. Can't I ever have another drink, says he, as sad as a kid leaving home? I'd take as little as I could get along with, says I. I'll promise to do that, says he. He did, too. About the second day after he would got back to his son-in-law's place, he sent for me to come over. I finds him walking around the grounds as spry as a two-year-old. Well, says I, how did the folks take it? He chuckles. They don't know what to say, says he. They can't see how a specialist who charges five hundred dollars for an hour's visit can be wrong, but they admit I'm as good as new. How's Babbitt? says I. That's why I wanted you to come over, says he. Now watch. Then he lets out a roar you could have heard ten blocks away, and in about two shakes, old wash day shows up. Ha! You shock nose sculpin! yells the Commodore. Where's your confounded tea cart? Go get it, sir. Yes, sir, directly, sir, says Babbitt. He comes trotting back with it in a hurry. Got any of that blasted, decayed milk in it, says the Commodore. No, sir, says Babbitt. Are you glad or sorry? Speak up now, says the Commodore. I'm glad, sir, says Babbitt, giving the salute. Good, says the Commodore. Then open up your wagon and mix me a scotch highball. And Babbitt did it like a little man. I find, says the Commodore, winking at me over the top of his glass, that I can get along with as few as six of these a day. To your very good health, Professor McCabe. Stand it? Well, I shouldn't wonder. He's a tough one. And ten years from now, if there's another Dago fleet to be filled full of shot holes, I shouldn't be surprised to find my old Commodore fit and ready to turn the trick. End of chapter 11